风吹，从天河的心啊，归入绽放，山影回。我希望 know about grassland songs. That's what this song is. I'm jamming to right now. It's a whole genre of Chinese music celebrating the grasslands, and we're about to visit the grasslands of Inner Mongolia. Enjoy. Huh? Street food. If you've been around since the beginning, you'll probably remember my buddy Alan. I met Alan my first year in China. He was a postgraduate student when I was a teacher here. He graduated, got the job. Got married, got a different job working for the largest dairy company in China. Now he lives in the capital city of Inner Mongolia, Hohad. In Chinese, it's called Huhehaotu. I took the sleeper train 14 hours up from Xi'an to Hohad. The high-speed train does not connect us yet. It was all right. It's been a long time since I have done the overnight train. You don't really sleep. You just kind of toss and turn in this little too small bunk all night. It's not very comfortable, but I expected to be really sore the next day, and I wasn't. So、uh, it's a win, as far as I'm concerned. Now, when I went to visit Alan, he did not have a lot of great things to say about Hohat. Actually, <laughs> the traffic is bad. The roads are bad. There's a lot of unfinished construction. There's like three or four bridges that are just halfway built. It's all kind of like a daily annoyance to him. He's just trying to get back and forth to work, you know. He said Hohat feels like Xi'an did maybe about 20 or more years ago.、And、there's not that much to do. Plus, he has to commute back to Xi'an every other weekend because his wife Vicky still lives there. So all of that's probably mixed in to his impression of Hohat. To be fair, on the positive side, the summers are great. They're not really hot. Yeah, you don't even need air conditioning. And the sky, I just maybe I've been living in Xi'an for too long, but I just I can't describe to you. The it's so clear. It's so blue. It's like you're closer to the sun. And honestly, you're there for just a short time, and you realize why Mongolian culture really gravitates towards the sky and the clouds, and like that's what they make a big deal about. When you see these temples or yurts that are like white and blue, that's Supposed to make you think of the sky. Now, Inner Mongolia is a border province with the Republic of Mongolia outside of China, just to the north. And you can really feel the increase in cultural diversity there. Hohat is still majority Han Chinese, but there's a very large Hui population. There's a stronger Buddhist influence than we get in Xi'an. I think that's because Buddhism was adopted by Mongolian culture at one point. And in addition to Mongolzu, the Mongolian ethnicity, there's several other Chinese ethnicities represented in the region. I learned all about it at the history museum. Of course, the OG Mongolian leader is Chengji Sihan. That's how you say Genghis Khan in Chinese. He is still quite revered, as are many of his descendants. The museum has some really cool Mongolian history stuff, as well as a section on the Chinese space program and the Circle of Life. That violent taxidermy. The center of Hohat is called Dajiao. That's named for the temple at the city center. Down here, Alan and Vicky took me to a restaurant with a notice at the door: "All employees are Mongolian, so please speak Chinese slowly when you order." 100% authentic up in here for some very unique dishes. Let's start with that golden cheese. This stuff is creamy and sweet. Dairy is actually a really big deal in Inner Mongolia. The two largest Chinese dairy companies are both based here. Cheese. Or cheese adjacent products are a big part of Mongolian cuisine. We also had some legit yogurt and a really special milk tea. They call this salty milk tea. It's just hongcha milk and salt, and then you add some toasted millet to the top. So unique. I really liked it a lot. You can add sugar and make it salty sweet if you want to. I drank way too much of this. I did not sleep much. Just throwing back tea late at night, but it was so different. I also ate some camel. This little meat pie is filled with a mixture of herbs and spices and camel meat. We asked the waitress, "Yo, is this legit camel meat?" And she said, "Hey, our place is legit camel meat. Anywhere else you go, they tell you it's camel, they're lying to you. But we got the real camel." Is what she said. It didn't taste much different from lamb, actually. Lamb is like the staple meat in Inner Mongolia. Lamb every day, all day, pretty much every meal. I ate some lamb. This is called hot stone barbecue. Lamb jerky, lamb ribs, and blood sausage cooked with these hot rocks. Throw in a few veggies. This joint was crazy filling. But they have all this street food too. I saw some things that weren't especially Mongolian. I almost went for a lamb kidney, but I was already so full of meat. I ended up getting a local sandwich called la beza. In Hohat, a lot of what I would call bing, like a round, flat bread, is called beza. This is a flaky bread with an egg inside. 
as well as a mixture of spicy tofu, a sausage, some fish balls like you get in Hot Pot. I was already way too full to appreciate this, but the bread was flaky, it was good. We also got a Swan Nai Bing, a uh, yogurt bread. It's a little sweet, it's not fried on the outside, but the, but the texture and the flavor of the bread itself reminded me a little bit of like the inside of a donut. Cause I ate a ton in Ho Hot. Let me show you some more snacks before we get to the grasslands. This is called man mian. It's a stone pot of noodles and other stuff. You put the lid on it, cook it in a fire. The noodles have a kind of overdone texture, really starchy, but I still like them. We got this one with chicken to take a break from all the lamb. We also got these deep fried chewy bings. Very similar to the sticky millet snack we had in Sarah's hometown. This one's full of a little bit of red bean paste. Like a stick to your ribs snack, as if I wasn't full enough. For breakfast in Ho Hot, we had xiao mai. Now I'm used to this kind of xiao mai. It's full of sticky rice and maybe a little meat. But ho hot xiao mai are filled almost entirely with lamb. We got some steamed and some fried, as well as some lamb meatballs, tofu gan. But did I mention how full I was? These xiao mai were probably my favorite snack in ho hot, besides the salty milk tea. On a different day for breakfast, we had this. This is pretty much just sheep guts. Stomach liver, everything except for the meat of the sheep and stewed together in like a spicy broth. On the side we had some donkey rolls, showed this to you guys before, this is a common breakfast. We had donkey meat and some green pepper and a nice little bread. Lamb, chicken, camel, donkey, I'm covering all the meats up in here. Meat groups we didn't even know about. I'm talking about my stomach was so heavy. Everywhere I felt like I was carrying the meats. Alan drove us about two hours east of Hohat to the grasslands. Huang Hua Go. Yellow flower go. Okay. <laughs> and how do you say, we always say grassland in English, but how do you say in Chinese? Yuan. Actually, there are grasslands to the north, east, and south, and a desert to the west. This mountain is called Yingshan. It was important back in the Tang Dynasty, serving as the northern border of China, I think. This grassland was really something to behold. This uh, valley. This is more and more steps. It's kind of ominous when we look at the people who are coming back up, and they look exhausted. It's a lot harder on the way up than it is on the way down. Uh, I don't want to explain the stone's uh. Uh, history. Okay. Uh, he said it's uh, ice, ice century. <laughs> ice age. Ice age. Ice age. Yeah, when the, the four sides. When there were dinosaurs on there. Yes, yes, yeah. And there were the mountains there. Oh, okay. So you can see all the other mountains they are made of the the dust. Yes. Dust. Yeah, but only that mountain is made of the big rock. You come to the grasslands. They're famous in China. Why does Chinese people like it? What is what does it feel like? It feels uh, relaxed and uh, kind of cool. The view is very wide. The air is fresh. Oh, you can ride a horse as well. Yeah, ride a horse. Ah. And you can drive anywhere you like. It's like a no limitation and no pressure like you live in the cities. Ah, I see. For the grassland, you can go anywhere. Uh -huh. right? It's so called Yuan Sheng And especially in summer, it feels very comfortable uh. and cool. What's Yuan Sheng Tai? Yuan Sheng Tai is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like natural. Yeah, natural. Mm -hmm. I think rural America has a little bit of this feel too, right? Just like the freedom of the wide open space and, and just like the sky stretching so far. We really don't get that in Xi'an. I was skeptical of the grasslands at first, to be honest. Like, what's the big deal? It's a bunch of green. But I just spent half a day there and I was like, I got it. 
There's a reason there's a whole genre of music dedicated to the grasslands. I had a great time with Alan and Vicky. So many great stories that I actually just don't have time to recount here in this episode. I'm just always excited by the multiplicity of cultural perspectives in China. It's not something that we talk about very much. In the West, I think China is mostly perceived as this huge monocultural empire, and I get why that is, but the more you get out, the more diversity there is to observe. I had never eaten almost any of these things until I visited Inner Mongolia. And I have a feeling every province is like that. And that's a comfort to me. In the next episode, we'll have a quick stop off in Malaysia before street food comes to an end. I'll see you then, street foodies. Y'all eat it on the street. Or the grasslands, right? Still, watch out for the parasites wherever you go. That's just generally good advice. Street food. Season 10. Change the battery in my mic.